So, good morning everyone. Good morning to everyone watching Century Times. Magandang umaga. This is Faye Almeranez, live from the Philippines. It's currently 10 in the morning of April 8, and today I'll be sharing with you our situation here in the Philippines amidst this pandemic. With that said, I'll be touching mainly three points. First is our current situation. Second would be the major issues that we face or have faced. And third, forward-looking what is the foreseeable future and the game plan of our country. So to give a brief background of the Philippines, we have three main regions, namely Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Luzon is where the capital Manila is located, and this is where the first case was recorded last January 30. Community quarantine was imposed, and then it escalated to enhanced community quarantine, Flights were banned locally and internationally, and state of calamity was proclaimed. I'm currently based in the province of Samar, which is located in the Visayas region. And the first case in our province was confirmed last March 23. A week, about a week after, uh, as of today, we now have a total of five confirmed cases, and some were acquired through local community transmission which leads me to the current numbers of our country. As of yesterday, April 7, 2020, about two months since the first confirmed case, we have 3,764 positive cases, 177 deaths, 84 recoveries, and as of April 6, we have administered 22,958 tests in which 82.7% turned out to be negative. For the current situation, the whole Luzon is on Enhanced Community Quarantine, or ECQ, which was supposed to end this coming April 15, but there were warnings given by the World Health Organization, the Interagency Task Force of the Philippines, about ending the quarantine too early. And so yesterday, the government confirmed that the quarantine was extended to April 30. According to the Interagency Task Force, the earliest that the, they can assess the, eff the effectiveness of the lockdown is around April 29, which was one of the reasons for the extension. Going to my second point, uh, the issues that we face. So there are seven. First would be the lack of medical facilities. And I'll be emphasizing more about the perspective of the rural areas in the following points. The metro is already having a problem with its medical capacity. So lack of ICUs, lack of ventilators, lack of space for isolation. And my fear, and I believe a lot of people share the same, the same fear, is that our facilities are not at par as with that in the metro. And even they're already having a problem about it. So how much harder is it going to hit us here in the provinces? There were instances where some suspected cases, when the symptoms are mild, they are asked to do a home quarantine to give way to more serious cases. So the government um, then assigned and repurposed buildings into isolation spaces to accommodate these um, person under investigation or PUIs. The second issue I'd like to talk about is the lack of testing kits. Currently, we're, we aren't testing enough to support the lockdown. For two months, only 22.9 thousand tests were done. When the lockdown in Luzon was announced, a lot of people decided to go home to their respective provinces. So there was a surge of people going to the rural areas outside Luzon. So this was an issue as testing is harder in the provinces since most testing centers are located in the metro and they're already occupied with their um, with the cases of their own there were cases where people under invest investigation died without testing and the result turnaround is also a problem sometimes it takes days or weeks to get the result and there were times where the patient died and only got the result that he or she is a confirmed COVID case after the death. 
There were also instances where medical practitioners took to social media to convey their sentiments about not getting tested, even though they're highly exposed. And there were cases where protocols or the criteria to be eligible for testing weren't upheld. And there were uh, a group of people who were prioritized more than those that are actually showing symptoms. So the government issued a plan in order to increase testing capacity. And um, this is th their goal is to have 8,000 to 10,000 tests per day and a 24-hour turnaround result for results. In order to do this, uh, they have to maximize laboratories, assign big strategic testing centers, and they've announced that they'll be doing mass testing this April 14, starting this April 14. Through this, uh, their projected numbers would be 4,000 tests per day by April 20, and 13 to 20,000 tests per day by April 27. The third issue I'd like to talk about is the lack of personal protective equipment or PPEs. Th these are gloves, full body suits, face shields, face masks, uh, which are essential to protect our frontliners, medical frontliners, doctors, nurses, hospital and medical staff from the danger of the virus as they are exposed at high risk conditions. Or uh, without this, the problem will just escalate. Since we have a lack of PPEs, this led to the communities and frontliners to use improvised PPEs. In my community, and I think it's the same for other communities in my country, we made use of raincoats, ponchos, DIY masks, face shields, and repurposed gloves uh, to, as a substitute for um, proper PPEs. Currently, we still don't have enough PPEs, but more are coming in, more are being donated, more are being procured by the government. Until then, um, we made use of improvised PPEs. The next issue would be lack of manpower. Our medical frontliners, when exposed to a suspected case, have to undergo a 14-day quarantine. So this decreases the medical uh, manpower of the facilities. There were several things that made this issue worse. There were people who traveled from places with COVID confirmed cases and are showing symptoms but lied about their travel history. Because of this, the medical staff in that facility was exposed and had to quarantine as a precaution. To address, to address this lack of manpower, the government asked for volunteers from medical practitioners to join the war against COVID. Which brings me to my next issue, uh, lack of awareness and the stigma that goes around with it. People lie because of fear. They're scared of being a suspected case, so they lie, uh, which does not help the situation at all. It actually makes it worse. Uh, discrimination became apparent, became apparent to medical practitioners and whenever there's a person who is a suspected case. There were actually a case reported in the news about um, where this discrimination actually materialized into physical violence. And this is because of the stigma going around it that, you know, if you're a COVID-confirmed case, then it immediately results to death. So there's a lot of fear going around. Next would be, my second to the last uh, point would be the execution of this Enhanced Community Quarantine or EZQ. Awareness is related to the ex execution of the lockdown because I've observed in my own community that uh, actually in some communities, are, uh, they are reactive instead of proactive because they're not so aware about the extent of the danger that the virus brings. And so they only react and practice proper protocols when there is a confirmed case. This becomes a problem because the exposure of a positive case, as you might already know, can be exponential. And they're capable of spreading the virus even without showing symptoms. 
in some cases in our province, there is no strict execution of the lockdown. So, in my community, we have imposed, uh, uh, we have imposed a twenty-four uh, hour curfew for its residents, and only one res one member of a household can go out to buy the basic needs. But there are times that this isn't really strictly imposed, and people still don't follow because. As I've said, not everyone's aware about how dangerous this virus is. Which led to, um, there's actually a campaign that our frontliners started saying, we go to work for you, you stay at home for us. Because going out does not contribute to stopping or mitigating the risk of the virus. It actually helps spread it. So, which is why they encourage us to stay home. My last point would be not having enough resources to support the ECQ. This, in my humble opinion, is one of the most alarming issues. When total lockdown is implemented, this means that people can't leave their houses. No work, no pay. The government will be the one supporting the daily basic needs of the citizens. So food, water, medicines. And this becomes problematic if not executed properly support and safety economic safety net is needed to ensure people's cooperation with the lockdown like for example uh, the most affected here in our country are the poorest of the poor which is majority of the philippine population those are the individuals or families that rely on their day-to-day -day earning for survival there were issues of some communities not receiving the promised aid. And so they had no choice but to breach quarantine protocols to go out and work, just so they would have something to eat. There were protests demanding for food since they were cut off with their, uh, there's no inflow of income. They had no source of, they, they have no source for their daily needs. And this is where hunger becomes the enemy instead of the virus. So as uh, the game plan, going to the last uh, point I'd like to talk about, our foreseeable future. The game plan of our government is to push back the peak to 2021, which hopefully by then a vaccine is already developed. The reason why they want to push back the peak to 2021 is because seeing that Philippines is a third world country, we can't afford situations like that of Italy. If we reach that, we would have a really, really big problem that we might not be able to solve. And so our game plan is to push the peak back to 2021. The government also stated that if stricter isolation policy and thorough contract tracing is done, there might not be a peak at all. And if this ECQ is extended to a longer period, given that the Philippines is a third world country, it would be a hard blow, not just to our economy, but most importantly to our people. In line with this, to instigate the spirit of Bayanihan, Bayanihan is our local term for working hand in hand or helping one another. The government calls the upper class or those that are able to give aid if this ECQ is extended, given that they claimed that our res resources aren't enough. Talking about the new normal, when ECQ is lifted or is relaxed, strict social distancing will still be observed and this will be a constant in our daily lives until a vaccine is de uh, developed so until then this is the new social distancing is the new normal to end um this to end this i would like to share my own personal sentiment about uh, this whole pandemic we are actually at war with the same enemy here not just our country but the whole world it's against one enemy which is the virus so i urge that the authority and those in charge 
that this is the time to remember it, that this is the time to put people first before anything else. Because in the end, life outweighs it all. That's all I have to share for now from the Philippines. I send well wishes to your country. God bless and thank you for watching.